Good morning. morning. What a uh, blessing and a humble privilege it is to be here with you all this morning. Truly, truly humbled. Our family is just uh, just overjoyed, um, overjoyed to to see our Southside family and to be here in your midst. and And what a privilege it is for me to get to open up God's Word this morning. I'm truly grateful for that. I'm grateful you'd you'd be here to receive it. Uh, happy Father's Day to all the fathers that are out there. I, I'm very blessed that my dad is here, Jim. And uh, I love you, Dad. I love you a lot. I got a lot of family here, too, and I'm really grateful that each one of you are here. Uh, what a blessing. For any, uh, just, just considering any, any fathers uh, or any men that are here who, this is their first Father's Day, um, celebrating without their earthly fathers here, I just want to give you a special um, grace and love. I think I can speak on behalf of the whole body when I say, just, we just want you to know that you are so loved in Christ um, this morning. And, uh, and we love you. We just pray this time of worship would be especially a blessing to you, um, to you fathers, to you men and women who are here. I also want to recognize, I don't know if you noticed, but the McMillans are here as well and so grateful they'd be here. Well, this morning we are going to be opening up God's Word in 2 Timothy. If you turn there with me to 2 Timothy chapter 2, we will be in verses 1 through 7 together this morning. 2 Timothy 2, 1 through 7. Let me pray for our, our time together in God's Word if you join your hearts with me this morning. Oh, Father, Father, what a delight it is to be in your house here, to worship you, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. Oh, Father, I'm just humbled, humbled to be standing here before this body. God, I thank you that Christ is our head. I thank you that all blessings come from him. And so, Lord, I just pray that every heart this morning would be looking to Jesus, that we would be beholding our our King, our Master, our true and heavenly Father. God, I pray you'd be honored in this time, Lord. If your Spirit doesn't attend to these words, then they're just words. And so, Father, I pray that your Spirit would meet us, would fill us, would illuminate our hearts, that we may lay hold of of more of you and be greatly enriched. And, And in this time of worship, as we continue our worship, Lord, I pray that your name would be honored. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, again, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 7 is where we'll be this morning if you'd look with me at our text. You, therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. The things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. Also, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not win the prize unless he competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer ought to be the first to receive his share of the crops. Consider what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything." Amen. Well, this is our our outline for this morning. Um, Very simple outline, three points. First, we will look at strength misunderstood. Then we'll look at strength understood. And then thirdly, we will look at strength applied. So I decided to keep it very simple, especially for the fathers here. (laughs) The majority of our time we're going to spend in in verse 1. Um, because I really feel that verse 1 is, is almost like the heading for the rest of this passage by which everything else flows. And so verse 1 will be our focus, and, and certainly we'll deal with verses 2 through 7 as well. Um, but that's where the majority of our time will be. My, my desire in preaching this text this morning is certainly to exhort, certainly to embolden, to stir on greater faith in Jesus Christ. 
but perhaps even more important, I pray that we might be encouraged. We might be encouraged as we recognize that the source, the source of our strength is not man-made. It's not self-willed, but rather it's supernaturally acquired. And this applies to the entirety of the Christian life. And I pray that's what we'd see this morning. So let's begin with our first point, strength misunderstood. Now certainly much can be said about societal indoctrination and how that's affected the Christian church today, specifically among the men we call leaders in the church. There's a great, great need for faithful men who will not compromise the truth but will faithfully proclaim it with boldness and unashamedness. What reason to rejoice that here at Southside, man, we, we have so many of these faithful men faithfully proclaiming and entrusting this word to other faithful men and women as the gospel goes forward. Praise God for that. Now, preaching the truth with boldness and unashamedness, certainly it's immensely important, but that's not necessarily the direction we're going to go with our text this morning, although we will see there is a link here. The focus this morning more has to do with what I said earlier, the daily pressures on the Christian life and the temptation, and I'd say propensity, to resort to our own resources for strength rather than to the resources that are offered to us in the gospel. And so this is a message for all Christians. Certainly I have a burden for fathers this morning as you minister in the home and in the church and in the workplace. But this text truly can be applied to to every Christian, I think, our daily walk with God. What are these daily pressures that we face? Well, I'll just share personal testimony here. Uh, I've spent many days now wrestling, wrestling in, in Mexico with with purpose, with calling, with God's will, with future plans for the ministry, with my failings as a husband and a father and as a son, desperately desiring more fellowship with God and yet coming up short oftentimes. And that's just the truth. Listen, if we try to walk this Christian life with those thoughts constantly before us, we will grow weary and we will burn out. When we allow those thoughts to dominate our focus, what happens? Well, we likely, we will turn to ourselves, our own resources, and we say things like maybe what the world is preaching at us, like I just need to pull myself up by my bootstraps, or I just need to be stronger, I just need to keep grinding, I just need to keep on keeping on, right? Those are some of the sayings we hear, and in some ways, there is truth to the fact that in the Christian life, we need to press on. We need to press on, and it's not always going to be roses and dandelions. It's going to be hard sometimes, and we have to endure and stay the course. However, self-will and determination only get us so far, and what I hope we will see in God's word this morning is that available to the Christian is something far greater than self-will, and namely, it's the, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. So let's, let's set our context this morning for 2 Timothy very quickly here. That This is the second of two books that Paul wrote to his beloved son in the faith. 2 Timothy is the last of Paul's inspired letters and it's, it, it comes just before his martyrdom. This book is seen as Paul's final charge to Timothy. Paul and Timothy had a very deep relationship. We see that in verse 1 of our text when Paul's address to Timothy says, as my son. And so it was Paul who led Timothy to the faith along with his mother and grandmother. And Paul's ministry with Timothy, it's well documented. All throughout Acts, we read about it. They ministered together in Berea, in Athens, in Corinth, in Jerusalem, in Philippi, and in Ephesus. And yet as Paul writes this letter, we know he's chained in a cold Roman prison cell with no hope of deliverance. Some commentators have suggested that Timothy may have been in danger of spiritual weakening at this point in his ministry. This is a concern that's specifically evident in Paul's exhortation, such as in chapter 1, verse 6, when he says, kindle afresh the gift of God. Or verse 7 in chapter 1, when he says, replace the spirit of timidity with that of power, love, and discipline. Chapter 1, verse 8, when he says, Do not be ashamed of me or of the Lord, but suffer willingly, Timothy. Verse 13, hold to the truth, Timothy. 
And now our text this morning, be strong, be strong, Timothy, in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And we know the time that Paul wrote this letter was wrought with persecution, wrought with persecution. Nero, the Roman Empire of, emperor of this time, was known for executing Christians in large numbers in horrific ways, and, and Paul would, would soon become one of them. And many had, deflected from, had defected from the faith, including those close companions to Paul. In chapter 1 of 2 Timothy, Paul specifically states, All who are in Asia turned away from me, among whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes, and yet, verse 16 he says, and yet Onesiphorus didn't. So Paul continues in verse 1 of our text this morning, you therefore could also be rendered, as for you, Timothy, as for you, don't be like the disobedient ones. From verse 15, chapter 1, I'm banking on you, Timothy, not to defect like the others. Let's look at our text then and, and begin with this first, and I'd say it's the first real admonition that, that Paul gives us, gives to Timothy in this letter, and it comes in verse 1 of chapter 2. Be strong, be strong in the grace, he says. Be strong in the grace. In the what? In the grace. I thought he was going to say be strong in might. Be strong in will, right? And then I could really beat my chest and, and shout who are or something like that, but that's not what he says. He says, be strong in grace. Be strong in grace. Now, what does he mean by grace? What is he referring to here? Well, simply defined, this is what grace means. You ready? Unmerited favor. Unmerited favor. It's a gift of help that God gives to the needy. That's what grace is. So he says, be strong in grace. You mean to tell me this isn't something that I can muster up and do myself? Exactly. Exactly what I mean. Now understanding our need for grace begins with a proper apprehension of the gospel, I think. I think this is very important. Because the gospel is a gospel of grace, isn't it? It involves an unfair transaction, right? Substitutionary atonement is an unfair transaction, and hence grace. Just consider this with me. God for sinners. Righteous for unrighteous. Holy for the unholy. Faithful for the unfaithful. Perfect for for the imperfect, lovely for the unlovely, just for the unjust. The truth is that Jesus came to us in the midst of all of our mess and he saved us. The gospel is not clean yourself up and then come. The gospel is not figure a few things out and then come. It's not learn a lot more doctrine and then come. Get your ducks in a row and then come. That's not the gospel. The gospel is I am absolutely and utterly hopeless in myself. I need grace. I need grace. And so Christ came for the sickly, for the lowly, and for the sinner. I can remember as a, as a kid learning this early and then practicing it on my, my younger brother, Mark. And the trick was this. Mark, I've got two $1 bills here. And I'm going to trade you these two $1 bills for your one $5 bill. And you see, you see, Mark, now you will have two and I will only have one. <laughs> Why are you going to do this for me, Nick? That's, I, I love you that much, Mark. I love you that much. That's an unfair transaction, right? <laughs> My parents are here to attest it's not Nick, Mr. Nice Guy. I, I, I can assure you that. I, I was a sinner myself. But listen, Christ, Christ was on the other side of the most unfair transaction ever in the history of mankind, and that's the crux of the gospel. 2 Corinthians 5.21, he who knew no sin. He who knew no sin. 
He was the blameless, spotless lamb. He who knew no sin became sin for us. That in him we might become the righteousness of God. Praise God. Praise God. That now we are accepted before the holy and perfect Father. That's incredible. Nothing comes close to what was displayed on the, on the cross where Jesus took our place. And that's why Paul says, for by grace you have been saved, right? For by grace you have been saved. And so our only hope in salvation is the grace of God. And that's, it, that's why salvation, it's a gift. We bring nothing to the table except for our sin, which made it necessary for Christ to die for us. So here's the key. The very grace that made me new is the very grace that is transforming and perfecting my inner man as this body decays. I am but a weak vessel and the power belongs to God. This grace is what carries us in the Christian life. Ken's been preaching on this. I mean, Romans 6, I think he even said, we've been bought by grace and we are kept by grace. And that's so beautiful. And so what a marvel. What a marvel. If as a Christian you woke up this morning, I'm still believing. I'm still here. I'm still believing and following. How are you doing? Man, I'm kept by the grace of God. And John 1 says it's an unlimited grace. For of His fullness, for of His fullness we have all received in grace upon grace. It's an abundant, abounding, continual grace And so what can we learn from this grace? Undeserved favor? Yes, it's a pardoning grace. But as we see in our text today, it is also a powerful grace. God exerted that grace when we were dead, making us alive together with Christ. And so grace, it empowers us to continue. It empowers us in our service to God. And look at our text. Look at our text. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. This grace is reserved for the Christian. It's not a manufactured grace. It's a grace that comes through unity with Christ. And so the call, the call is simple. The call is to put your faith and trust in Jesus. If you have not seen yourself as beneficiary of of this incredible antithetical gift of salvation, I implore you to look away from yourself. Look away from yourself, from your own works, and look to Jesus. Look to Jesus, who freely offers Himself to sinners. This is grace in Christ Jesus. And notice what that does. It shifts the attention away from ourselves, and it shifts it to our King, to Jesus. He's the one who holds us and keeps us. I like what Alistair Begg said, and I wish I could say it in his accent, but I'm not going to (laughs) try. He said, we need to stop saying things like, I'm believing. I'm being strong. Beloved, the proper response is in the third person because He is guarding me and He is keeping me by His grace in Christ Jesus. And isn't that the truth? It's all His grace. It's all His grace. It's the only reason I can stand here before you. It's because of His grace. Well, let's deal with then the exhortation because the exhortation is so important. He says, be strong, be strong. And too often, I myself included, I hear something like this and I kind of get fired up, right? It kind of gets me emotionally fired up. Like, yeah, let's be strong. You know, kind of like I said, like something I can do for myself. I, can, I can't, I can be strong. And that's not at all what the text is saying. What does this actually look like? Well, here's what's important. This be strong is a passive present imperative. Grammar lesson. It's okay. I needed the grammar lesson. Grammar lesson. Present imperative first. It's a command. And because it's in the present, it has ongoing implications. It's a state of being, you could say. And the passive voice, meaning that the subject, Timothy, or us, 
think we can say, is being acted upon. The subject is being acted upon. And so this can be rendered, keep on being empowered. Keep on being strengthened. I think the ESV renders it, be strengthened. Be strengthened. Allow God's power, His grace, to strengthen you. And the parallel text to this one comes in Ephesians 6, verse 10, right before the whole armor text. It says, finally, be strong in the Lord and the grace of His might. I'm sorry, and the strength of His might. But what is empowering us? What are we being strengthened by? Certainly grace, but grace is not a person. This is a ministry reserved for the Spirit. And to better understand this, I want to highlight two important texts, and I think they'll help us to really understand what this being strengthened looks like. And, and praise God, you guys have been in Romans 8, I'm I'm aware, and and so you're seeing a lot of this already. But turn with me. This is a little bit of a paper trail, but I promise you it's worth it, okay? So follow with me. Let's go on Ephesians 5. Let's begin there. Ephesians 5, 18, all right? Ephesians 5, 18, and let's, let's read that. It says this, And do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation. But be filled, be filled with the Spirit. And it goes on speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. It's a beautiful passage. And so we have this contrast set up, right? Don't get drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit, all right? And certainly there's a parallel comparison here. Someone who's drunk is under the influence of alcohol, right? And so the Spirit-filled person is under the influence and power of of the Holy Spirit. So here's, here's, here's the key. Be, be filled, likewise, is a passive present imperative. Meaning what? Meaning we could render this imperative, be being filled. I think Pastor Ken has preached that a number of times. This Holy Spirit that is filling us, be being filled, be filled by the Holy Spirit. And then we get this great outflow of what that produces psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, making melody with our hearts, giving thanks to God and submitting to one another, just the very thing we have witnessed today and that has been so missed for Jackie and I to have this corporate fellowship and corporate worship with you all. What a blessing. One more passage, turn to then Colossians chapter 3, and now this is the sister epistle to Ephesians. In fact, if you follow Colossians, you can pretty much mirror it with Ephesians uh, because they're so similar. And and I promise we're going to lay hold of something beautiful here, I think, in our text. But look at Colossians 3, verse 16 with me. This is what it says. It says, Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you, with all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. It almost exactly mirrors Ephesians 5, doesn't it? And yet it speaks not of the Spirit, but of the Word of Christ. Of the Word of Christ. And so we can say that there is a, there is a link. These two are, go hand in hand. They're married. That our being filled with the Spirit is, is equivalent to our being filled with the Word of Christ. The Gospel, the Scriptures. And oh, that the soul prospereth when it is full of the Scriptures and of the Gospel as the Spirit attends to us and conforms us. The Holy Spirit fills the life controlled by the Word. And I think that stands in the face of a lot of the modern day church and how we deal with the Spirit. The Spirit indwells the life controlled by the Word by the gospel, by the scriptures. A quick note that's worth mentioning. This spirit-filled living that we see here in in Ephesians 5 and in Colossians 3 is most clearly manifested where firstly? Firstly, in the home. In the home. Hence Paul's exhortation to husbands, to wives, to parents, to children. And that's what, what follows in both of these texts. 
And so just a, a quick application. Do you model these things in the home foremost? Right? The home is our first sphere of influence. <laughs> that was a conviction to me. Now, being filled with the Spirit, as I said, is a concept that's been confused in the church and has confused me for many years. And so this is important because of how it applies to our text. I thought when we get saved, we are indwelt with the Holy Spirit and we're given the Holy Spirit as a seal of God's promise, just what we've seen in Romans 8. Then how am I to be filled with the Spirit? Are there two spirits, one who's doing the indwelling and one who's doing the filling? No, absolutely not. Don't leave saying that that's what you learned today because that is not true. That is not true at all. All. This is about influence. And so certainly at salvation, the Holy Spirit indwells us. But being filled is coming under the influence of the Spirit. And so the question is not this morning, how much of the Spirit do you have? How much of the Spirit of, do you have over there? It's like as if we had these little you know, gauges above our heads as we walk around. I mean, I'm running low on the Holy Spirit. That's not how it works. The question is not how much of the Spirit do you have, but rather how much does the Spirit have of you, right? And that's influence. That's Ephesians 5, that's Colossians 3, what we've seen. And so here's the beautiful tie-in to 2 Timothy 2. To be strong is to be strengthened. It's to submit ourselves to the sphere of grace in Jesus Christ as the Spirit acts upon us to strengthen us, and to transform us. That's why Romans 5.2, this grace in which we stand. Jude 20 says, keep yourselves in the love of Christ. That's where God's blessings are. I'm submitting myself to Him. Keep being strengthened in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And so, question... How do we measure strength in the Christian life? In our submission. And I would even say in our weakness. I cannot possibly do this in my own strength. I am utterly and completely dependent upon the Lord. His grace working in me by the Spirit as I'm being transformed more and more into His image. And you see how this is our daily living as Christians. Daily, deny yourself and take up your cross and follow after Jesus. That's the call for the the Christian here this morning. Living in Mexico over the past eight months has really impressed this truth on our hearts. I speak for Jackie and myself, maybe even our boys, although they don't know Jesus yet. And I say this not out of pity. I say this to show you the great blessing of this. So receive it that way. Some of the common graces that are available to us here in America have been taken away when we moved to Mexico. And I'll just list a few of them. There are many, but I'll say this. Things like well-paved roads. What a blessing. Man, I'm driving. I'm like, this is so different. I don't feel like I'm, I'm avoiding all these potholes everywhere. Clean parks. I went to a park yesterday. Man, so nice clean, right? You didn't have to worry about your kids picking up glass or something. Cell phone service, right? The ability to drink water from the tap, the freedom to flush toilet paper down the toilet. It is a a blessing. (laughs) The ability to pay bills with the touch of a finger, right? On your phone. Freedom to walk down the streets without fear of danger. Freedom to talk to people without a language barrier. What a blessing. Hopefully that's changing for us as we learn language. Something happens when those graces are taken away. When your four-year-old son comes to you and says, I'm ready to move home, daddy. Those are hard moments. Those are hard moments. When these graces are taken, it's easy to get discouraged. And yet, it's also one of the sweetest blessings. And that's what I'm here to testify to you all this morning, because our dependence It's not on those things, right? Rodney, Tanya, the whole family, the Francos, they know it too. Our dependence is not in those things. Our strength does not come from those things. Those are conveniences, but our strength and our dependence is in Jesus Christ. And that's what we're here to testify to today. He is near to the broken and the contrite in spirit. 
Draw near to him and he will draw near to you. When I am weak, he is strong. And Jesus said, apart from me, in John 15, you can do nothing. You can do nothing. And Joel read it this morning in Psalm 16. There is so much joy to be had in this when we depend on God. Because it says in his presence is the fullness of joy. And at his right hand are pleasures forevermore. So that's where the blessing is. Christian, this morning, lay hold of that. If you don't know Jesus, know Jesus. Come to know and believe on the gospel and lay hold of that. That's where true blessing is. Well, how do I obtain this grace? Because I want it. I want it. The answer is the same answer that Ken gave you last week and probably throughout Romans. Look to Christ. Look to Christ, the author and the perfecter of our faith. This grace is in Christ Jesus. And where do we go to see Christ? His Word. Prayer. These means of grace that God has so graciously given us so that we can see more of Him. You hold a powerful tool in your hands. This is a powerful tool. Father's beloved church, let's be faithful to use it. Let's be faithful to use it and not forsake this great means. I just want to see more of Christ. Seek Him in His Word. Seek Him in His Word and in prayer. We have so many faithful, so many faithful examples of this here at Southside. Many who have run the race for a long time. And I've always been blessed when I ask them one of the biggest lessons in their Christian journey. And this is how they respond. I bet you so many here would respond this way. I have a greater awareness of my own weakness and my need for Christ. Right? I'm looking at all the older saints. They're giving me head nods. It's the truth, right? That's the measure of Christian maturity. That's the measure of Christian maturity. I need Christ. And I'm, I'm just more aware of my daily need for Christ. That was certainly the case for Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 9 through 10. This is what he said. He said, For I am the least of the apostles, and not fit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me did not prove vain, but I labored even more than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God with me. Amen? You see, for Paul, awareness of his need drove his discipline. He was a debtor to grace. We need to be aware of our need, our daily need for Christ. Our third point from our outline is strength applied. Strength applied. What does this empowering produce? What are we to do with this grace? Christianity is not a spectator event, is it? It's not. Look with me at 2 Timothy 2, verse 2. And we'll we'll actually go verses 2 through 6. Let me just first read verse 2 for you. The things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these, entrust these to faithful people who will be able to teach others also. So here's how I read these next six verses. There's disagreement on how it all flows, but this is how I've put it together. First of all, having been strengthened, I see that as kind of the heading by which all of this flows. And then you get this main exhortation in verse 2, which is entrust this word. Entrust this word. And as we entrust this word, what will happen? We will endure suffering, verse 3 says. And so those go hand in hand. As we entrust this word, suffering will come. And then here are three pictures of what entrusting this word as we suffer hardship is to look like. Okay, Number one, as a soldier who does not get entangled in civilian pursuits. right? He's undivided in his pursuit. A soldier who leaves his trench and abandons his call, abandons his call and his duty. He who leaves his trench. Secondly, an athlete who competes according to the rules. So he has integrity. An athlete who cheats is no athlete at all, right? He who cuts the corners doesn't follow the rules. 
Thirdly, as a farmer who is hard at work. He's diligent and faithful. Man, are they ever so resourceful, working before sun up and, and until sundown, hard workers indeed. And this is to characterize our Christian lives. Ministry is hard. Parenting is hard. It requires 24-7 work that oftentimes goes unnoticed, right? I think every father and mother here can attest to that. It's the truth. And so what is our command? The command is entrust, as I said from verse 2. Entrust what? Entrust what? All that Paul has taught Timothy up to this point. It's the deposit, the treasure spoken of in 2 Timothy 1. It's the truth of God's revelation. And this truth has been confirmed by others. Right? We're not lone rangers in this on lone islands. That's a mistake. The truth has been confirmed. And we are to entrust it to other faithful men. John MacArthur calls this entrusted word a living link to Jesus Christ. Right? We have generations and generations of teaching, four generations that are addressed just in this verse alone. Paul to Timothy. There's, there's two right there. Timothy to faithful men and faithful men to others. And Jesus started this work of teaching and preaching, and it's continued to this day. Praise God. Paul to Timothy, he says, keep teaching. No impurity. Keep entrusting it. What a calling in season, out of season. Keep teaching. Be faithful to the gift that God has given you. Entrust it. And I'll just just address the older men and women of this church. Be faithful with us Younger men and women here, be faithful with us. I know we're stubborn sometimes. I know know sometimes we're the product of our generation, but be faithful. Be faithful. Jesus started this work, and we are to continue this work. Stay faithful with us. There's so many, so many young men here and young women here who are willing and ready to receive, to receive from some of the older saints here. Younger men, receive. And as you receive, get alone with God and wrestle with these truths and let them transform and change your inner man. And then go to the highways and the byways and go to your neighborhoods and, and to, your, to your families and, and go to your workplaces and, and maybe go to the nations. And then trust these words to other faithful men who will take this living word then onto others. What a calling! What a calling! Christianity is not a spectator event. For fathers, let me just say fathers, it begins in the home. Your first disciples are your children, right? Those are your first disciples. And so let the gospel infuse your parenting. Daily remind your children of these glorious truths and model it for them. Model for them this complete dependence on the Lord. I know how far that goes with your children. And we're, we're just in the beginning stages of that, but God has been so gracious. Now with each of these illustrations, I'll point to, out the fact that with each one of them, we get a promise. Look in the text with me. Each one of these illustrations, the soldier, the athlete, and the farmer, we get a promise. And I think I've missed this the many times I've read this text. We, be, we, we begin with the soldier. It says, the soldier pleases the one who enlisted him. And so our undividedness to this task of entrusting the word brings great reward because we please the Father. Isn't it true that every, every young boy wants to please their earthly father? I can remember many times dad playing football. And if I dropped a ball, I just remember I'd go to sleep that night thinking, ah, oh, man, I dropped that one, though. I had some other good catch, but I dropped that one. We, I, think, I think it's ingrained in us. We want to please our father, and it's a, great, it's a great thing. And so the soldier pleases his father when he does not entangle himself in civilian affairs, but stays undivided to the task. The athlete, by your integrity, your keeping of the rules, you will be crowned as the victor. Oh, what a promise. What a promise, a promise that Paul is about to lay hold of in this text as he's about to face his own death. The farmer, by your diligence, look at what it says, you will be the first to receive your share of crops. This may refer to the fruit now in the ministry, but it also emphasizes the anticipation 
of the root, the fruit of the reward that is to come in glory. Amen. Praise God. Certainly, these promises are to motivate us, but we are not to forget that each one of them was blood bought. The grace of Christ infuses all of this. It's all over these verses. Which is why in verse 7, Paul encourages Timothy to consider what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in every way. And I believe Paul, as a tender shepherd, is anticipating possible reluctance as increased suffering comes. He says, he's saying these things are challenging. And Paul recognizes that as Timothy has more ministry experience and as he suffers, only then will he properly understand these things as the Lord grants understanding in them. Right? In closing, in closing, don't leave here discouraged. Leave here encouraged. Because who is our greatest example of this? I want to direct your attention one verse further. I said we were only going to look at the first seven verses, but I couldn't resist verse 8 of 2 Timothy. Would you, would you read that with me? Just the first three words. I think we all have pretty similar translations. Just the first three words. Let's read it together. This might be the Latin America culture that's coming out of me, but let's read it together, would you? Remember Jesus Christ. Amen? Remember Jesus Christ. Christ. Remember Jesus Christ. Timothy, fathers, children of Christ, when you feel the challenges of ministry or just the Christian life in general creeping in, don't look to your own strength. It'll only take you so far. So far. Look to Christ. Look to Christ. Remember Jesus Christ. He is our chief shepherd. He is the one who perfectly modeled this for us. Complete and utter dependence on the Father, moved by the Spirit, entrusting this word to faithful men, the disciples, while suffering great hardship, like a faithful soldier on a mission, an unwavering athlete in a race, and a diligent farmer tending to countless needs. Only Jesus lived this perfectly to the Father's standards. And yes, his whole life, his whole ministry, completely dependent on the Father. Just watch his life, how dependent he was on the Father. Remember Christ. And it says the Son of David. It's a reference to his humanity. He can sympathize. For it was Christ who had to walk the way of the cross and taste death before he was exalted. He suffered the greatest cost of all. And it's because of him that we have this faithful ministry even now today. You see, these promises, these promises are blood-bought. These promises are blood-bought. We cannot do this in our own strength. And that's why when we finish this race, we will only be able to cast our crowns before the throne as we worship our God. Amen. Look with me at Re Revelation 4 in, in closing. Verses 9 through 11. We're all debtors to grace. Grace that carries us all the way. And hence verses 9 through 11. And when the living creatures give glory honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne to him who lives forever and ever the 24 elders will fall down before him who sits on the throne and they will worship him who lives forever and ever and will cast their crowns before the throne saying worthy are you our lord and our god to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and because of your will, they existed and were created. Father, indeed, this is our cry. We are completely and utterly dependent upon you. So it was in salvation. This grace 
that was freely offered to us in Christ. And so it is in our daily walk when we are united with Christ. We are kept by this grace, Lord. What a marvel, what a marvel that we are still following, that we are still denying ourselves and taking up our crosses, certainly imperfectly, Lord. But we thank you that you keep us on the course. And we thank you, God, that Jesus is our chief shepherd and he will lead us all the way to the end until we're home and until we're in your presence and we will perfectly praise you and we will perfectly give thanks to you, God. Oh, how I long to to properly thank you for all that you've done and how imperfect I do that here on earth. But one day, Father, we will be before you and we will worship you as the lamb who was slain on our behalf and as the, 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 the lion who now rules and reigns, you are our king and we will worship you as such. God, be with us as we conclude this service and worship. God, be with us. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.